Glitzy musicals and straight plays with big name performers may get all of the attention on Broadway, but they're just the tip of the iceberg of what makes up the New York theater community. Hi, I'm Gordon Cox from Variety for the American Theater Wing, and joining me today to discuss a decidedly different type of theater, those with venues of 99 seats or under, are you know, so Jonathan Bank, Artistic Director of the Mint the Theater, the Sarah Benson, do, Artistic Director of Soho Rep, Susan Burnfield, Artistic Director of New Georges, and David Van Asselt, Artistic Director of Rattlestick Playwrights Theater. All of your organizations have uh, really specific mission statements, um, you know, very defined sort of goals for your uh, organizations. Tell me about what those are and why those are important. Sure. Uh, well, our mission is really focused on producing work that can only happen in a theatre um, that isn't a TV show or a film, that it's really designed for a theatrical idiom. So that's the kind of primary thing that we're looking for. My understanding of mission is it's really defined by programming. Um, so although, you know, we tweak the, the actual language of our mission from, from, t from time to time, or that, you know, basically I think mission is defined by what you do. Um, that's how people get to, to understand your organization and how you create the identity of the organization. So um, that's, that's how I focus on, on mission, is really through um, defining ourselves by our programming. Our uh, mission is, is to bring new vitality to lost or neglected plays. And, but I think my audience just thinks they like the work we do. And the fact that it's lost or neglected is, is secondary to them. Um, but again, in terms of uh, carving out a niche for yourself that, that allows you to make a case when, when seeking funding, that you yeah. are doing something that other people aren't, that you're filling uh, a need uh, and you're filling it uh, hopefully uniquely. Um, uh, it's it's important, and and the press helps to create that identity. So we you know so we promote our mission to the press, and then the press restates it when they discuss our work, and then we can quote that you know in our funding proposals. But I don't think the audience cares. Now our mission is kind of complicated because we produce plays by women, and that's what we started doing. But the aesthetic has evolved, and, and I feel much more strongly about that now. So I'm more interested as an artist and as an artistic director in the work. People like to put the mission on you about the women thing. We just, again, sort of want to come, you know, they're good plays. You're going to come because they're good plays. It's a good thing to produce women, sure, but really it's, you know, it's always about the work. We have a similar aesthetic kind of to Sarah's in that we're interested in a more heightened um, kind of work that can also only be seen in the theater. And, and you know, every day we're not thinking about the women thing. We're kind of thinking about how can this be the best play it can be. And also in terms of serving artists, it's only going to help them if people leave the theater saying, well, that was a great play. So we have really, um, um, the, you know, and the press also will read something into that. So we actually try to take that part of the mission away from the press so that they just look at the work um, standing alone and not this sort of other part of our mission, which it's our mission to, you know, push these artists forward and they're only going to be pushed forward if the work is just about the work and really good. So it becomes more complicated than mission can sometimes get in the way of what you <laughs> kind of want to do. Yeah, I mean, we, we also are sort of flexible in our mission because we, we, we are primarily a, a theater that does new, new American playwrights and new American plays, and we try to nurture playwrights and we try to bring them along. We do a lot of developmental work. Um, and, but we also <laughs> sort of reserve that little, that little space where we can you know, bring in a play that is not going to get done here if we don't do it. And there's, there have been plays all along mm -hmm. throughout our history where we've just <laughs> Turned around and done. We did a play by Lars Noyen last year, who is a very, very highly performed playwright in Europe, and no one even knows who he is in in America. And we felt like that was an important piece of the puzzle to to, to do to sort of bring along some of these. And we've done. Uh, we almost did. <laughs> we talked about doing Blasted a couple of years back <laughs> <laughs> because no one it seemed like oh, no one wow, was going to yeah. do it. So huh. thank you for doing that because I th it's a it's a great play and, and it should be you know done and, and it has wasn't getting production. So we'll do that from time to time. But primarily it. it I, I, it does, I mean, you know, missions are about, in a way, grants and about trying to, you do, you just have a, you do have, want to have a sort of a primary personality, I think, to the company. I mean, people, I mean, I, I know if I'm going to come to the Mint, I, what sort of, 
I, I'm coming there because I want to see precisely what Jonathan is doing, you know, has did it with, with everyone else here. And, and so I think there's a, there's a, there's a p part of that which, which makes a lot of sense, but you're always trying to sort of create some elbow room. In that, yeah. within that, you know? I actually, I, I'm not. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think that it, it's a very, it, it's a, you know, it's a valuable management tool. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a real. I mean, it's like the spine of a play when you're directing. If you, you, you say, well, there are three different possible interpretations, but only one supports my understanding of the play, and so therefore, it's easy to make the choice between three seemingly viable options. And so I, I find that that um, adhering to the mission with some scruple just makes it easier for me to make decisions about what we do and don't do. But there was a, um, an evolution to your discovering what that was. Absolutely. And I think that that story Absolutely. is a, such an interesting story. And, and I know that um, the thing that always makes it interesting and yet difficult for me to talk about what we do is that I feel like that evolution is continually ongoing. In fact, it's the only thing that keeps me going and that there wasn't that kind of discovery and if we weren't able to have some sort of shifting flexibility, as you say, yeah, all the time, right, then, absolutely. you know, it, I would just, pfft, out. I have <laughs> no reason to do it anymore. And yeah. it's, it's, and especially when you're working with artists and not as you are, but as we are as very new artists, you know, you're discovering something new all the time and the discovery is the point. So you really hope that, um, that you can kind of foster that. And the only way I can foster it is through staying flexible myself. And, and I feel like that's sort of a point with small theaters is that um, there's something kind of wonderful about, about having a sort of nimbleness where you know, A, you're maybe slightly more under the radar or, or there's just, there isn't so much at stake that you can't take that chance and that you can't um, continually kind of stretch the boundaries of what it is you're supposed to be doing. Many of you at this table are the founders of your organization or the co-founders. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, how what led to the founding of... Well, in my case, uh, it's, it's, I was a playwright. Uh, I say was I still am, but but I, <laughs> it's become much harder to to, to sort of get to, to balance all that stuff. But we originally, uh, I we I, my there was a group of seven playwrights that were actually meeting and and reading each other's plays, and and those meetings almost inevitably broke down into this was 15 years ago, and when actually there was a real you could really state a case that very little new work was being done, and so. Those meetings always broke down into a lot of people griping, and I, after about a, you know, you can only take so much of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at some point I said, well, let's just so let's just let's make a company and start it ourselves. And we and we sort of we were sort of a, what what thirteen P is right now. We we sort of were that originally. We there were seven of us, and we and we just did each other's plays for the first couple of years, and we just sort of figured things out. And then at a certain point you have to sort of decide whether, okay, now we, we've, we've, we've gotten a little bit of a reputation as a company, and you sort of have to decide, okay, now are we a company, and are we now supporting new work, and what's our mission, and all, of, all those questions come up. And at that point, we decided uh, that, we, yeah, we would be a company, and we would support new, not just the seven of us, but, you know, whoever came our way. And uh, so the person that, that founded the company with me, Gary Bodesarte, and myself, we said we put it to a vote and everyone said yeah yeah let's do that and then immediately the other five left <laughs> <laughs> so so that's the origin of of, of, the, of a company in a sense uh, the two that that stayed on really you know were interested in in, in nurturing and going on and doing that and uh, so in a nutshell that's our that's our story <laughs> And you, you founded yes, your organization. I did. Um, I was an actor, and the genesis of our organization was really, as so many smaller theaters are, was really so that we could work. And it seemed like if we could work, if we wanted good parts, plays by women might have them. And, um, and I really had no, I didn't know anything about new work. I had never been in a new play. I'd never even thought about new plays. I was looking for plays to do and couldn't find any. Um, and I just sort of thought, well, there must be playwrights who are like me, who are thinking about the same things, and how do I find them? And so I kind of set out on this journey to find them. I found it oddly difficult and it seemed like there wasn't, they didn't know each other. You know, once I met one player, I thought she would know everybody and then they would, they would really have some kind of a grouping. And, and this was in the very early 90s, in 91 and 92. And um, 
that just didn't seem to exist. So eventually what happened was our, our company really evolved toward becoming that community and toward um, people really knowing each other and doing a lot of fixing up playwrights with directors and, and things like that as well as producing. We produced a lot in the first two years and there was a similar sort of starting out with a lot of people and people falling away and the crazy person who really wanted to keep going, continuing and just going blindly into the future, um, which I think is in some ways necessary, and the acting fell away somewhere along there, became a playwright after knowing the playwrights. Um, but the, but, um, but, but we actually took some time after, uh, off from producing the, after the first few years because it was just so daunting and it was so hard to find an audience and this community thing wasn't happening because there were so many artists and we just wanted to get to know them and, and, and develop their work. And I realized there was this thing called development, both for plays and artists. And so we founded this workspace called The Room and started doing things there. And that became much more comfortable and it kind of um, became much more the company I wanted to be a part of and, um, and, and the community that I wanted to be a part of. And so that's kind of grown from there. And, and obviously we started producing pretty soon after because once you start working on plays, you have plays to produce <laughs> and you have things that you want to see. Um, but it's, it's been long and slow, but also good. We're still here. I'm not the founder <laughs> of Cement, right. but I, I'm the author of the mission. So you know there there was a you know an entity that was the mint that I uh, that was founded by a fellow I went to school with um, uh, many years ago, and and he started the company in the early '90s, and I got involved a little bit later, and um, and ultimately there was a transition, and then it took um, as, as Susan was referring to, it took. It wasn't until 99, really, that we kind of committed to the mission of the lost or neglected place. Yeah, and I'm the fourth artistic director, so I'm very far from <laughs> <laughs> being the, the, the founder. And who are your audiences? Uh, well, we're really lucky in that we have a really young audience. Um, about 75% of our audience is under 40. Um, so. Yeah, that's kind of, our, I mean, our base is, um, is growing and what we're finding now, which is great, is that we're able to retain audiences that, you know, come down for one show who haven't been to the theater before, they, they now keep coming back, which is really exciting. So yeah, that's kind of our, our base. Yeah, I I, th I kind of feel like our audiences are the same, or the s very yeah, similar, and definitely. that we also have a younger, much younger audience, and we we tend, I think, like Soho Rep, we, I think we tend to take chances. We take we tend to have plays that are sort of in your face a little bit, and we tend to t to do there's a kind of work which is um, challenging, and so so there's a certain kind of audience that we're actually after in a, in a way, and, and we certainly want a younger audience, and uh, although even that's not so important because it's just it's about there are lots of younger audiences over 60, you know, in a sense, because because uh -huh. they're interested in the work that we're yeah. doing, and I think primarily because we're in, so we're sort of playwright centric, and we're all, we're looking more at playwrights than we are at audiences in a sense, and so we're always constantly saying what play needs to be done, and then and then sort of trying to figure out okay what audience is going to come and see that play, but but we do have a base like you, know, we have a yeah. base of people who are sort of interested. Uh, in, in a way that, like the old circle rep used to have, that there were people who wanted to come and see who was new, who was interesting, who was working, what's what that kind of thing. So you, you so don't we, have subscription, right? We do have. Oh, some, you yeah, do. Okay. Yes, we do. Yeah. 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 yeah our audience is flipped, except that we're probably more than seventy-five percent over forty. <laughs> 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 and you know, and our audiences are hardcore theater goers. I mean, that you know, they're. I think that by and large, they're the people who are going five times a month and, and upwards. And, um, and we're just in the loop of things that, that people who want to stay on top of everything that's going on, you know, they include us. We, um, you know, I feel the same way that, that David was describing is that, you know, our programming decisions are based on the plays, that what play needs to be done, not what does the audience want to see. You know, I'm confident that um, that audience will turn out. Um, you know, we have a core, but we don't sell a subscription. We don't obligate anybody to see anything that they're not inclined to see. And um, uh, and you know, we and we don't 
study demographics because it, it doesn't really matter to us. It, you know, the important thing is, is to do the plays that you feel passionate about and uh, communicate your passion and, uh, and an audience will respond to that or the right audience will respond to that and turn out. Yeah, we're also very artist focused and, and really it's only in the last couple of years that we've had time to even think about the audience coming in, but since then we've been working harder, we've experienced a lot more retention and they're also younger audience, probably similar. Do you mentioned you have uh, subscription subscribers, yeah. do none of the we, rest of you do? Have you talked about it and what are the advantages of having them and not having them? We, we don't really have the human resources to handle subscribers and also I feel very much like Jonathan does about people making a decision to come and see individual projects and we're so project based in the way we work generally and that and we're really trying to make a separate kind of event out of each project under our rubric um, every time that it almost doesn't make sense to us to work seasonally and try to connect them in that yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, when we, when we started subscribers, um, it was more because people came to us and said, you know, can we just, get, <laughs> can we just, just have a subscription? I mean, we're coming yeah. all the time anyway. And, and we've never pushed it. I think that's the, I think the difference is yeah. that we don't push it at all. It's, it's never been something that we've gone, because I think that's right, that your plays are, especially with us, we're very eclectic. And we are, we are, you know, because we're doing, we're looking at, at playwrights and trying to find just a voice and, and talent, we're never looking at, you know, I think with subscribers, the tendency is that you're going to want to do the same play over and over again. I think that, you know, to a certain extent, there's a subscriber who wants to come and see the same, you know, play. Yeah, I think that's I, or, or to the contrary, actually, I think you could make the case that, the, that, that if you are programming a season meant to look good on a brochure, you're oh, yeah. creating false uh, yeah. uh, distinctions. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're, yes. cre right. you're um, Trying to I'm able to, to, to do another play like the last one if I choose to yes. without worrying right. about this right. yeah. fiction well, it's, it's of a true, narrative though. of you the do, season. You do, I mean, I put together seasons year after year and it's, it is, there is a certain amount of, of that, that that plays into it. I can't help it, I mean. Right. But I think um, all those things are changing as well and I think even the larger theaters are seeing more single ticket buyers, more people who are deciding that well, day I and are looking right. at the subscription I, model and, and I saying, I think you can't eh? rely on it. Yeah, and so we're kind of lucky. We never work that way so we yeah. can sort of pull back from that even further and really make a case for everything specifically in, in ways that are creative and kind of fun for us to do right. and we yeah. don't always mm -hmm. even know our whole season before we start right. out which is also fun for us we try oh, to know our season now we <laughs> 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 but we're also at, a, at, a, at an odd juncture in our history and that is that, that, that you know the playwrights that we started with 15 years ago are now they're, they're, they're now at a point where in their careers where they really sh in a sense there's a you could make a case and say well Rattlesticks shouldn't be doing them anymore, but but they keep coming back. I mean, next season we're doing an Adam Rapp play, a Lucy Thurber play, no doubt, a Craig Wright play, and and I'm beginning to we're sort of at a at a little crisis here because we're feeling like okay, you know, in terms of that mission that you brought up earlier, what, what so are we, you know, how do we figure this out? How do we continue to, have to yeah. you know, if these playwrights who we've supported all their careers and they keep coming back and say yeah, but we don't, don't give up, but you know, don't stop. How do we how do we sort of juggle the two sides of that? How do we you know how do we and I'm sure that you know and you guys have have playwrights you've done over and over again. Certainly, so, Melissa James Gibson. Yeah. Um, and we work with Young Jean Lee in the past, and we're um, we've commissioned and are producing a show of hers next season. Um, so there's definitely some you know some folks in there who. Right. Um, right. Yeah, I find that really yeah. complicated because there's so little room and there's so many people and there is an mm -hmm. evolution and I wonder about codifying the sort of older friends and the newer like how that should become more of a programmatic thing to make sure that happens or whether we sort of take it piece by piece or it's a big question for us. Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. question. I mean we're actually now at the, in the, in, for the first time actually looking at, at, at uh, you know making us having a second theater so that we can do the, the Adam Raps and the Craig Wrights over there at the second mm -hmm. theater and, the, and keep our, our little 99 place, you know, 
concentrating on the on the new new voices, the younger writers, and, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, yeah, you know, not a good time to be doing it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know the uh, finances are getting very very tough. But but so we're looking at partner partnership kind of things, and yeah. being, we're going to partner up with the Barrow Street Theater, for instance, next season, and doing a couple shows there and and try to so so we're gonna and we're also adding a theater in San Francisco. Believe it or not, we're actually going to do two shows a year. Out there wow, to, to enable us to to do you know to again to, to try to find sort of weird and new locations <laughs> to, to help playwrights to get a show up with it that you know otherwise it wouldn't be done so we're sort of at a juncture right now trying to figure out how to you know how to expand and, and still keep the mission intact in a way but still do all these you know, the projects that we want to do David I think it was you who mentioned earlier the fact that you all have lower ticket prices and smaller theaters, and so you can only bring in a fixed amount of money from ticket sales. And obviously you all have ambitious projects like a theater in San Francisco. How do you make that work? We don't rely, we don't bank on ticket sales, um, so it's great when, you know, shows do sell, as, you know, as we're lucky that they often do, but we don't, you know, factor it in as being a big piece of the pie. Um, and yeah, so it's you know foundations, government, individuals, and corporate. Although that's dwindling, seriously, it's it's, 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 it's like dwindled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's dwindled. dwindled. It's dwindled. It's dwindled. It's dwindled. But it is a little bit like putting together a portfolio. You know, you have to, yeah. you have to sort yeah. of figure out. You know, we try to. I mean, <laughs> uh, what we try to do is always is a third from from box office and a third from private support and a third from foundations and corporations. Uh, and we've been pretty successful at sort of creating mm -hmm. that, that that blend uh, year yeah. after year. Uh, but obviously, at this point, we're now we're looking to see because we need to jumpstart some some new programs. And now, yeah. so, so now you can't do you know. So the box office is going to sort of lag behind for a little while until we can sort of yeah. put these things together. But um, yeah. we've been fortunate in finding some some people outside of, of normal sort of channels to to come in and, and help us with shows and things. But um, on the other hand, we just there were three donors we had from last year who who don't even have jobs this year. So, <laughs> yeah. so who are all the work for Lehman Brothers, and so you know, it's I, it's the next couple of years are going to be very interesting uh, in terms of trying to sort of see where the sport's going to come from, how you're going to you know how how you bring money in, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, um, I don't know. It's get, it gets tougher every year, and uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, I don't you know, I reject the notion that our ticket prices are actually lower. I wish they, you know, they might be, but they aren't. You know, in terms of the people that I consider to be my peers, the, you know, my off-Broadway brothers and sisters. Uh, um, and, uh, and in fact, so we have a top ticket price of $55, and, you know, and, and you know, the competition then is the $47 Broadway offer that, you know, that's coming into everybody's email box. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, you know, on that level, it's pretty flat. Um, and uh, I, the number of seats for us hasn't really been in a liability in terms of income because it's offset by, you have to do less promotion to fill your theater, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think, in fact, the supply-demand equation works pretty well for us at 100 seats. That, that our marketing costs are considerably lower than they would be if we were in a 200 seat theater. Right. That's interesting, because we, we, we don't use the supply demand thing at all. We, talk, we, we just had this huge conversation about it because we had this show that people were like prepared to pay anything for, basically. Right. Um, but we felt strongly that I don't, yeah, I don't know if this is what you're meaning, but just, you know, trying to kind of find what I'm that, not talking about ratcheting up ticket no, prices when you have a hit, although, you yeah. know, <laughs> why not? Uh, <laughs> um, but well, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting kind of balance. I um, mean, we've had shows that, you know, that have been very successful, and, and it is fascinating that at the end of the phone call, mm -hmm. they say, oh, by the way, after having given you their credit card number and expiration date, they say, oh, by the way, how much is it? You know that where the price is just irrelevant, and uh, um, yeah. But but what I'm talking about in terms of supply demand is is just I think that um, I think that a, there are a lot of theaters that are too big, and they create problems for me in right. in the sense that so they're they're giving away tickets mm -hmm. or or uh, doing 
dramatic discounting just to try to get a credible house, you know, to, to get up to, because they have 200 seats and they can sell 100 of them, but they need another 50 so that the house doesn't look pathetic. And, and, um, and that, that um, so the really savvy theater goer knows that, well, you just don't have to pay to see theater in New York. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of supply and demand. That we we can, there's, the supply and demand are fairly well balanced at 100 seats. Yeah. There are, you know there are enough people who will buy tickets. And it allows you to take the chances that you that you do. I mean, it allows you to sort of choose the play you want to play and just and just put it on because yeah. you can do that fearlessly in a sense. Because even if you're only going to get 30 for that particular play, it's okay. Whereas if you've got that 200 seat theater, it's not going to be okay. Yeah. And I think that, and then, and then that the 200 seat theater also then starts to actually impact on what plays you're going to choose because you're also thinking, oh, I can't afford to have a play put a play up that's only going to run in front of 30 people. No, right. not not not, not the theater. I mean, those are the thought, I mean, I'm having these thoughts because I'm now looking yeah. at that at that whole thing and thinking about, you know, we've always run in a 99 seat theater and we've always just done the plays we 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 felt like we should do and now. Um, but you know, the, but the the, the 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 other side of that is is that, for me anyway, I need that box office support. I, I'm going to need that more and more, and I'm going to need it's a, it's it's definitely a fundraising tool. And and when you have a play like Blasted, you know, it's it's you know, I feel like you know, it's not a terrible thing to sort of milk it a little bit because you know. I would suggest it. <laughs> well, I mean, we've, you know, I think the like the ideal pricing structure is like you know, yeah. like one dollar to a thousand dollars, so that you know, it it is really accessible. But people who can pay more, right, will. I yeah. mean, I'm exaggerating, I mean, we do, but we do, like you, you know, we do student we, discounting and all that kind of stuff. To and we to started doing this ninety nine cent Sunday right. as like a extreme a experiment idea. in that mm -hmm. and. And um, yeah, it's been really, it's it's just been great, you know. Um, but then now, Blast in the extension, we're charging fifty-five and sixty-five dollars, which yeah. well, you know, it's good. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, are, yeah, because we, and the, it's selling out. But yeah. the other audience yeah. sort of had their chance, and I, and yeah, I feel like there's like something we, about we had the ninety-nine cents, we right. had the twenty-dollar tickets, right. we had the thirty-dollar right. tickets, and, and I think that that's the know. reason to keep it low. Even yeah. when you've been on contract, you've kept it low because that exactly. we know who our audience is that's and what they want to pay. It's important. When the other people come in, but. I found that that there were people who would not buy a nineteen dollar ticket. That if they saw a nineteen dollar ticket, that, that, that affects that perception that, of the quality. That's yes. not my so, <laughs> yeah, that, so that was <laughs> happily. <laughs> so yeah. there were so that when we you know right. had our first right. thirty five dollar ticket, there was a whole new audience right. that was willing to right. consider coming to our yeah. theater, right. and they also have you know more then money. the capacity to yeah. make. Larger That's contributions. True. Yeah. But I feel like there's also a contextualization that you can create for both your ticket price and people walk in their theater that you, that you where you want people to understand what it is. And I and I feel like there's so much of that that um, that that we have to do generally about telling people what it is we do, why we do it, why we do it, where we do it, why we move around, why the play is weirder, um, and that that kind of um, is. Is an interesting part of the job, and that once people hook in, then they feel like there's something really special going on, and then they they might be more willing to experiment with other smaller. Price and once they also that. understand what goes into making a show right. and what it actually right. costs, I mean, I'm sure it's the same for you guys or all of us. You know, the the show's costing just on production budget with a small number of seats per seat per night. Um, a lot. We worked it out once. Yeah. It was like eighty dollars or something. You know, <laughs> yeah. if we were yeah. to charge, yeah. Right, yeah. I, no, yeah. absolutely. Just yeah. on production and you need them budget, yeah. not you need, on overheads. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah that, which is and I why. think if people understand what you know right. the yeah. production values you're putting into it, no, and I find I, that the response would actually yeah. cost. You know, yeah. Yeah, and, and the sad thing is that we're up against the medium where you know <laughs> where they can spend millions and millions of dollars and they can open in four hundred and fifty theaters and you know and do six shows a day and the actors' voices don't get tired. <laughs> you know? So, so you know, and and we've got that one. That's what I. You know, we have one house per night, one show, one seating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's it's it makes it very. It's a, it's you know it's a black hole. Theaters of, is a big black hole in that sense, and so you know that's why. Hey, milk it. Make some money. You know. <laughs> With smaller production budgets than a larger off-Broadway theater or a Broadway nonprofit, uh, do you find that your access to uh, the talent pool is limited? 
And if so, how do you overcome that? Which talent pool do you mean? <laughs> well, I guess that's my question. What talent pool are you aiming for, uh, and well, do you find yourself limited by your resources? I, I don't think that, it, yeah. that, that that is, you know, the difference between working at my theater and working at an off-Broadway theater that's twice as big, it still falls short of a living wage. You know, the, so the, so, um, I mean, it does happen that an actor has to make a decision sometimes that comes down to 100 a week, but mostly they can't, you know, you either can afford to do theater because you have a, because you just did a commercial or because you just shot an episode of Law and Order or you just can't afford to do it. Um, and the difference between making 375 and five and a quarter, you know, isn't the determining factor. Mm -hmm. And we do work that people want to do, that artists want to do. And it's so the I find that trumps yeah. Yeah. it 80% exactly. of the time. It it's it very rare. Yeah. Very rare, because even teeny all, as we are. Yeah, all our projects, are, 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 you yeah. Know, they, they attract the artists. And so, and, and you know, each, each, we, we rely on that, you know. We get great, we get terrific uh, talent down there in, that time, in our little theater. And, and uh, it's because they want to be in those plays. And, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to be in it, you know, so. Yeah, we feel the same, we're, yeah. you know, we're really, we feel really lucky to be able to work with the actors and the designers that, that we do. And it's something so. very intimate, I think, with both the audiences and the artists where um, we're so present because we know that it's this small handcrafted thing that people want to be a part of because that's the care that's gone into it. And I think that we see as producers, it's very much our job maintaining those relationships and making sure that the relationships are, are close and specific and caring. Um, you know, we're at the theater every night to greet the audience and we're there to greet the, greet the artists just as much. And we'll sit around during tech the whole, you know, because we were making this thing and we want to make it clear that that's, um, that's where our heart is, and, and we're on their side, and, that, and, and I think that, that both, both of those groups really feel that, and that's what I get out of it. I mean, if I wasn't hanging with the artists, there wouldn't be any point, point. and if I wasn't there shaking every single person's hand when they came in and making a curtain speech, what would be the point? I, I want to be present for all these people. They're, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. Um, and, and, so I, and so I feel like the, you know, the difficulties and the things that are small and the money and, and all those things kind of go away when I realize that, you know, it's a really special relationship that I get to have with everyone who walks in the door, whether they're artists or audiences, and there's no corporate thing that's in the way. There's, there's absolutely nothing in the way. It's only this relationship and that, that my understanding of what that is has been what's propelled my interest in continuing and what is you know the, really the most important thing for me. Can we also talk a little bit about your relationship with the larger nonprofits? How, how much back and forth is there? Um, do they at all come into play? You mentioned partnerships when, for instance, you have a hit as uh, Soho Rep has now with Blasted. Um, do you find there's an interplay between the two? Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of back and forth. Um, you know, I feel like all my colleagues from larger, uh, you know, larger theaters, you know, come and see our work. And, you know, I, I think we're all part of the same conversation. And I think that that's, that's really important. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Similarly, do you all act as, can you act as resources for each other in terms of the shows you, how does that work? Well, I acted as a resource for you. I gave you up my actor. You should explain. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the wonderful actor, Reed Burney, who's, who's in Blasted, oh, right. was, was also gonna, yes, was in Stephen Geometry. Belver's Geometry of Fire, which is also a wonderful <laughs> project. And um, yeah, so. I, I think we would like. To, I would. I think we would like to, to act as resources for each other, and, and to a certain extent, we do. But I, you know, it's we're all because we're all small, and it. And, you we're know, all and, small I, and busy. But yes, I and think it's 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 not. We, we try but one we thing can. that's true is that we're not competitive. I mean, we, the, I don't. Yeah. I yeah. mean, anybody who looks right. at a colleague as a competitor 
is wrong. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of like uh, yeah. script sharing yeah. and that kind of thing that I don't know about yes. you guys, but yeah. you know, yeah. we've Definitely. certainly yeah. had a lot of conversations. Yeah. And, and even you if know, it's not like really specific, the community, you know, again, it. I still wouldn't be here if I didn't know yeah. other people who are going through the same exactly. thing and the phone calls and the mentoring and the yeah. off the record mentoring and the exactly. and just knowing each other, running into each other is is you know, or going to a show and knowing half the people that it's so important yeah. and it's so important to know you have colleagues because otherwise it would be too hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. you have you presumably found a you found another actor. For yes. The <laughs> <with your fire. laughs> it was okay. Yeah. Yes, it was okay. Yeah. It's, it, although you Very know kind. we 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 start the show on Saturday and it went, you know we actually lost Reed uh, a week. They they couldn't make up their minds. <laughs> so God, so it, we, we lost. The, <laughs> we we were a week into rehearsals before we we had to replace Reed. So that that. It, we're a little, okay, we've got a show on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously that means you all work with many of the same actors. Yes, yes, same. yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, and there's, because there's a core of actors in New York who are, you know, who are terrific theater actors and who are dedicated to the theater and who want to be there and, you know, who also supplement that by doing the movies and doing TV appearances yeah. and so forth. But. You know, there's a there's a real, real, true group of, of terrific, terrific theater actors in New York, which sort of go a little bit unheralded, but um, are you know are amazing, you know, amazing presences on stage, and so I think we all sort of share in that. Absolutely. Tell me about your current real estate situation and what the advantages and disadvantages are. <laughs> 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 uh, Real estate. Who wants to answer that one? Yeah. Well, um, we've been, we were founded yeah. in 75 and we've been in our current space on Walker Street since 91. Um, and we have a wonderful, amazing landlord who um, gives us a, a terrific deal way below market value, which is literally the only thing that's enabled us to, to exist and continue in that space. Um, you know, I think long term, there is, you know, there's, there's certainly questions about the, you know, our, our, our production values and the artists we're working with is constantly growing and, you know, that there is a sense of disparity between the, the state of the space and, and the work. Um, but we've been lucky enough to get some grants to make some uh, improvements to the space uh, and equipment upgrades and all of that. So right now we're staying, we're staying put. And I think it's just a longer term sort of back burner question um, that's that's always part of the um, conversations. So, yeah. Specifically uh, for you, so yeah. what are the advantages of moving around as you do? Um, we love moving around. Um, we could call it happily transient. Um, mainly because, as I said, you know, we're very project based and we like to think. Of Actually, can you tell us a little bit about some of the theaters that, sure. uh, and why they were good for various yeah, projects absolutely. that you had recently? Um, well, we did a play called Dead City by Sheila Callahan, which was a New York City adaptation of Ulysses, and it took place all around New York City, and it was supposed to have all this video. Um, and I found, when we developed it for about two years, and I found out about halfway through that time that 3LD, Three Legged Dog, was opening this new space in way lower Manhattan with all this <clears throat> video capacity. So we were the first residents of that theater and there's just no way that we could have produced this gigantic, enormous play, which when I read it just seemed like production challenge um, without having, without being able to be in that enormous space with the seven video projectors that they provided us with this residency there. And so we worked there. Um, we we did a very expansive and big play, God's Era at the 13th Street Theater, which is CSC's home. So that was those were those were two of the bigger projects that we've done. And it was just amazing to be able to give artists what they needed um, and to kind of look at I, I sort of when we sit down and we look at a play and we really want to we do a lot of plays that are very design heavy, that don't take place in living rooms and are not very neat. They're big and messy and those are the kinds of plays that we like. So the theater space has so much to do with the way the, uh, the production ultimately is going to come out. And it's exciting to get to sit down. And sometimes it's frustrating because there are so few spaces left in the city. But it's exciting to get to sit down and actually have a conversation about the architecture as much as a conversation about the play. And hopefully, if everything works out right and if we start you know, well enough in advance to find a space that's 
perfect for that piece. We work in the Ohio Theater a lot, and that's always like coming home for us. We've done the play we have coming up in our last production at the Living Theater, which has a brand new theater on the Lower East Side, which is kind of fun. And why is we that a good fit for this particular production that's coming up? Production that we're doing? Yeah. Um, it's, um, we're doing this play called Hillary, a modern Greek tragedy with a somewhat happy ending. Um, and and this, this is not like our biggest, like this is a fit match necessarily with the space, um, but it is a very kind of enclosed space that allows um, the, the, the simplicity of this kind of Greek thing that's going on to be all that's there, I think. I think it's gonna gonna fit in nicely because there's an intimacy with it and because you're not like filling something cavernous with something that's meant to be pretty simple. Um, and it has these columns, it has these kind of amazing um, gray, plain, concrete columns, which with both of the shows that we've done there, I get to have a really big part in the show. So again, there's architecturally something that already is very resonant, and I feel like the set design um, that Lauren Halpern has designed and really goes with what's already there in terms of finding a color scheme and, and, and you know, having this Greek thing going on. So. Fun. There are also, I'm sure, uses to staying in one place, like for instance, <laughs> in your audience. Yeah, where they're they going. know where they're coming. <laughs> yeah, they, exactly. The people know where they're going, yeah. and they um, and there's their sense of. I mean, they identify the place with their feelings about the place, and you know, and and um, and the sense of home. You know, we have it, and but also artistically. Um, you, as you get to know a space, you know you you learn how to make right. the best use of mm -hmm. it, and it's great to be able to learn, f you know, from one show and apply that lesson to the next, or maybe not to the next, but to one yeah. three years later. Yeah. Or, That's right. So there are a lot of advantages. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, you start to get a sense of what shows are going to work well in that space after yeah. a while, and and, and, and and again though that does it does impact a little bit on what your choices are because I'll like we'll do a Sheila we're doing a Sheila Callahan play uh, next after the after the Stephen Belber and you know the the play that I really of course I liked this play tremendously of hers but but I also felt like well that's a play we could really do well for her in this in our space and and so that you know there were, there's, a, there's other Sheila Callahan plays I've looked at where I felt like. I don't know that we could do, you know, the best yeah. theater to do that that play of hers, and so we, there's a certain amount of that that you that, that sort of plays into it. I think for Jonathan, though, I mean, he just he's, he's whatever he wants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, um, I have never said that we can't do this play in our space. I've occasionally said. Uh, I hope I'm not doing a disservice to this play by doing it in our space, um, but. You know, the alternative is it doesn't get done. So yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Just, we just and we're we're tackling a huge thing in the in the in next fall where where we're actually going to put on a trilogy of plays. I don't know how we're doing it actually. But <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I mean, we're doing Adam Rapp is writing a trilogy. That's why it's all world premieres as a special. We're doing our fifteenth season next year, so it's a, like a big deal for us. And so Adam is writing us uh, three plays, and and they're all in rep. There, it's ten actors, which I don't even know how we can fit them into our dressing room. Honestly, <laughs> uh, and it's and it's you know so it'd be like a Tuesday night one show, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and each play is fifty years apart. It takes place in the same room, but it's all each one is so nineteen fifty three, two thousand three, and then and two thousand fifty three, and which means there's, it's going to be a huge uh, project in terms of trying to fit you know the trying to figure out how we're even changing the stage on a night basis, all the costumes, where they was going to store them, <laughs> all that kind of stuff, and and so that's for us. That's that we're really going to stretch uh, our limits in, in doing a project like that. Ordinarily, we would it, it, we're, we'll, we try to stick the projects around six actors <laughs> <laughs> at max, and so, so which we can afford bet more, you know, than this ten actor thing. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Oh, we do ten all the time. Yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I think about that. <laughs> I think about how can you do that? <laughs> Actually, last year we did two shows with both with fourteen. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're, you well, the know, older we're, plays, we're, too, are, yeah, you know, yeah. you, you know you're, you're that, yeah, I, it's, I, I can't decide that I'm going to, that I need to play with six actors. You know, what I have found is that um, since we do rely perhaps more than you have expressed on ticket income, um, 
you know, I, I'd like it to be about 50% of our overall budget, which is a uh, little over a million. Um, and sometimes it's less than that. But um, the only way that I am confident that I can sell tickets is if I do plays that I'm confident <laughs> are worth doing. And you know, and, and you just have to set aside the economic considerations. And in, in the sense, if you, when you pick a play that is cheaper to do but not as good, you won't sell as many tickets. It's mm -hmm. you know that that's clear to me mm -hmm. that that people buy tickets to good plays. Yes. Yes. I think that's a really scary thing um, coming up, especially I'm very interested in scope and we've been trying you know, with projects like Dead City to be bigger, to feel like there's more scope, to feel like I don't see scope on the stage and all I want to see is something that's big and excites me. Well, and, and if you want to do the like thing that, you know, that can only be done on the stage yeah. and yet it's one set, two characters, you know, you, you it's, know hard. it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's, it's, it's yeah. Hard. So we're starting early with the design thing and, and I think that it's it's a big question being as small as we are going into the current who knows what is is how you know does it mean the subject matter has to be more scopeful or more actors or something else that because I think real estate is a big question um, yeah. going into that and if we have to work in smaller theaters or if the bigger theaters no longer exist because you know that's our biggest question is will the theater be there next year um, you know it's it's um, scary <laughs> for the <this laughs> small theater with the big ambition <laughs> yeah. With marketing and advertising costs as high as they are, how do you find uh, how do you find your audiences? How do you reach them? We, um, I'm kind of obsessed with marketing and communication. Just in you know, not just in terms of selling tickets, but in talking about what we do. And so that's kind of how we approach marketing. Um, it does obviously impact ticket sales, but we really try and focus on communicating what we do to people. Um, so we don't take out that many ads just because, you know, as you say, the cost is prohibitive. Um, so we do a lot more sort of grassroots type stuff. Does the of, internet play a big role for Yeah, any of absolutely, you absolutely. We, we've been doing a lot more um, internet, internet based um, and more sort of video interactive, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, and also we do a lot of postering, a lot of flyering, all that kind of thing, um, which we found really, really effective. So yeah, we do take out some ads, but not, not a ton. I don't think marketing is effective for reaching an audience at all. I, I think you, you, know, you build an audience exactly. and then you communicate with them. Yeah. And then the people who are not part of your audience, I, they don't respond to ads or flyers or, or emails or anything. Um, and uh, I mean, they're not responding to advertising. They're responding to word of mouth, mm -hmm. to recommendations yeah. of their friends, mm -hmm. right. to reviews. But efforts that we have made to try to get new people into the theater uh, to make a commitment in advance of, say, an opening or any press or any performances have uh, the last couple of years just fallen entirely flat. So we, I mean, we use flyering to, and emails and whatnot to get our existing audience to purchase tickets. Yeah. But strangers aren't buying tickets on the basis of, of internal communications. We tried something this time with Blasted where we did like, uh, you know, an advance buy and we ended up like selling it out before we even opened, which was which was, I mean, we have a tiny house, but I think definitely doing more of the kind of advanced stuff, our audience seems to be responding to. Yeah, and we do that, but we're doing it, we're, it's really focused on the audience that yeah. has already been identified as, yeah. as having yeah. come yeah. to the Mint and, yeah. and interest in doing it. That's exactly right. I mean, I mean everything that we do is, is, is in a sense, it's it's all internet, but it's all it's all it's it's ba trying to just build the word of mouth about whatever yeah. play that we're doing, and it's yeah. not it's not it's rarely. I mean, the the problem that we're the, I mean we're we're all small, and the advertising kind of budgets that that you're up against yeah. are crazy. I mean, we're looking you know, and people are sort of used to Nike money. You know, yeah. they're used to having <laughs> 140 hits before they even. Uh, oh, there's a sneaker. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, and we can't, there's no way that we can even try to match that. So I think that, that you're always looking for a way to go. I mean, we had some success, for instance, with Sliga, where we did these very, very, very funny videos and just put them on YouTube. 
And we had a huge response to that, and we, we sold that show out just on these, some, some interviewing Mary Louise Burke. But we don't have Mary <laughs> Louise Burke to interview on every show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so, so um, you know, it's, it, it's show by show, and I think that's the tricky part. It's very much show mm -hmm. by show, and yeah. it's very much about whatever that specific show brings, to, and, and you're trying to sort of figure out, okay, how, how do I sh sell this particular I think that's show, true. I think it's know. also becoming more and more about cross-pollination and cross-marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, the next show we're doing is a co-production with Page 73 production, so we're really drawing on how do we, you know, talk to both our audiences and cross-promote and really, yeah. You know, from show to show, it's not only that they're different projects, but I feel like especially with the internet, things wear out so quickly that you have to be on top of the next idea. Like if all of my friend theater companies send a blast this year, next year it's not going to be effective any longer. And I feel like I'm cycling through the marketing thingies faster than they exist. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook, it's over! You know, yeah. it's yeah. like, it's fast. In terms of programming, is there any material you wouldn't do or any material that you find you can't get that you maybe have interest in? Usually okay. the first, you know, when, when I'm dealing with a rights holder, the, you know, the first thing is, is uh, there's this play. And say, is there? I say, yeah, look in the basement, really. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm sure you own it, and okay. I'd like to do it. And, yeah. you know, and really? You want to do it? Great. I have too many things and too many people who want me to do them. So yeah, <laughs> I think that's like the opposite. more than yeah, yeah, problem. Exactly. Problem. There's such a wealth of oh, yes. So, it's so hard. Yeah, there's a so ton hard. of projects in the in the sort of development. Yeah, you know, that's line, the problem. Yes, that you've there's got, like yes. six shows that I'm ready to program right now that we just don't have the space. For, you yeah. know, we don't have the yeah. space in our season four. Yeah. Do you think that theaters your size are the last best hope for new playwriting and emerging playwrights? coming from the UK and being over here, I think there's just like a wealth of amazing new American playwriting here right now. Um, and I, I, I feel pretty optimistic about the future of, of new writing here. So I think it, you know, it is all of us, but I, th you know, I think the larger institutions are also responding yeah. to that. And, you know, I, yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for American playwriting. Well, and the larger institutions are now Opening smaller theaters. I mean, the roundabout yeah. is yeah. there. Yeah. You know, Lincoln yeah. Center. They're yeah. both yeah. opening right. their ninety-nine seat spaces, or yeah, uh, yeah. to to do right that to work. accommodate that. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've been good models. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want okay. to be bigger than you are ever? Maybe a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, 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 we are since we're since we're actually looking at that question right now. The answer, the answer is not really, but but you, you, there's also a sort of a a model of what's successful mm -hmm. that you you have to pay attention to. And, and in America, the model of success is you get bigger, and and so there's a certain that plus there are certain plays and playwrights now that we that we sort of are are, are sort of that's our that's our stable. Um, that we know or we can sell 200 seats a night to. And so if I can, I feel like, well, you know, those plays, maybe we, we have to find a way to, to get those 200 seats a night because that's also going to help us do those other younger playwrights who can't. And so, yes, you, you, I would like to be bigger, but I'd like to be bigger and, 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 and keep my, that complete hands-on approach mm -hmm. that, that's, but, you know, I think that all of us, yeah. what we yeah. like about what we do is that we're, we do it all. We're, we're, it's, it's great. I mean, you, you, you're, it's, it's, it's the ultimate in wish, in, in, in wish fantasy, right? You say, oh, I'll do, a, I'll do this play. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that's, that's one of the great joys about, about you know, you, you're actually working with all the people that, that you're, that you, and that's, that's the, the, the downside, I think, of getting bigger is, and the scary side of getting bigger for us is, is, is okay, am I going to be able to now, if I'm doing two shows in San Francisco and six shows in New York, which is our ultimate goal, how much real participation am I going to have in those shows now? You know, and that's the, for me, that's, that's like, oh, I don't know. That's, I, I got into this because I liked <coughs> doing the individual hands-on stuff, so. I don't know. So the question, the answer is, who knows? I have no idea. No, it's true. And I think that you know, it, it, there's a question of, of programmatically whether you get bigger, as you're saying. Or I feel like every time we have growth, it just goes into more support of the things that we already do. And every time I feel like, well, this means we're going to 
do more, it doesn't necessarily, it really means, well, let's, let's just make what we do better. And I feel like, I, I felt like we were in a growth period, but now, <laughs> not a great time for that. But, you know, but it, it, it asks different questions and how can you sort of do what you're doing in the best way you can. I, I feel like I've been through, you know, in the last few years, you know, I, I, I understood the growth model wasn't necessarily the model, but you know, but there always are attractions to that. And I feel like I've I've come through sort of a tunnel in terms of who we are and what our size is and how we can um, have the most impact with who we are. And I'm really so much more interested in that now. That um, that I, I know it's an interesting place. Yeah. You it's know, uh, uh, yeah. uh, we've grown substantially in budget size. You're not in theater size, but not because we sought it. You know, just because we capitalized on opportunities, and I think if you, you know, if you prioritize growth, right. it probably will cost you something that you don't want to, that you exactly. can't afford. It's but you certainly want, you know, nobody's locking the door and saying we don't want any more people, <laughs> or we don't want any yeah. more money. I think it's yeah. a balance between, you know, size and identity, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I think for us, we we don't necessarily want more seats, but. We'd like to be able to program, you know, constantly year round. We have the work there to do it, and I think, you know, that's that's where we would like to grow, um, and we are growing there. So, you know, I think that's it. But you know, do we want 300 seats? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> we like being yeah. intimate, and we like yeah. that intense experience mm -hmm. of of going to the theatre that um, you get in a small space. All right, and I think that's a great place to end this discussion. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Gordon Cox, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theater. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theater, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. Our annual theater company grants support New York not-for-profits, and since they began, have distributed nearly $3 million. We are also pleased to be the home of the Jonathan Larson grants, which support emerging composers and lyricists. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.